Um, welcome back. My name's Ben Jamla. I'm the director uh, of the Palestine Solidarity Campaign. Just before we start, I've been handed in a pair of glasses. So if anyone's lost some glasses, can they come and fetch those at the end and we'll keep them um, up here. Um, so welcome, everyone. Um, very pleased as director of PSC to be here. And just speaking very briefly in introduction, um, in my role as director of the Palestine Solidarity Campaign, one of the challenges uh, that we face within the solidarity movement uh, is how do we try to establish the right narrative frame of understanding to explain uh, what is happening uh, in Palestine, Israel. Uh, more importantly, perhaps, how do we challenge what is still the dominant frame of na narrative within mainstream political discourse, one of conflict and territorial dispute, um, and how do we replace that with a narrative that correctly centers on the story of Palestinian dispossession uh, and of the imposition by Israel of an unjust structure of power that we believe meets the legal definition of apartheid, whether that's imposed upon Palestinians living under military occupation, living as unequal citizens of the state, uh, or living as refugees. So conferences like today uh, that centre the story of the Nakba, that are part of the process of what Karma Nalbusi often refers to as the re-historicising of Palestine, and that put the refugee experience at the heart, um, are extremely important, particularly in the climate in which we live, where a central part, of course, of Donald Trump's so-called deal of the century um, is the assault upon UNRWA, um, but underpinning that are the support for Israel's attempts to redefine the status of a Palestinian refugee. So I'm very pleased that this conference is taking place and very pleased to be here. As you've heard this morning, uh, we have lost a couple of our uh, panel members. Uh, to lose one panel member is unfortunate. Losing two might perhaps be seen as careless. Uh, but the positive is it means we can give uh, more focus uh, to the two outstanding experts we have uh, to speak to us. And our theme in this panel is on the complexities and dynamics of the relationship between UNRWA uh, and the Palestinian refugees and how that has evolved uh, over the past 70 years. So I want to move straight away to introducing the first of our two speakers, and I'm very pleased to introduce... Uh, Dr. Anne Erfen. Uh, Anne is a department, departmental lecturer in forced migration at the University of Oxford, where she's part of the Refugee Studies Centre. Uh, her current academic research focuses on UMRA, Palestinian refugee history, and the origins of the UN's global refugee regime. Would you please welcome Dr. Anne Erfen? <laughs> Okay, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Thank you for giving up your Saturdays to be here, and thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me to speak today and for suddenly giving me extra time due to the halving of our panel. As Ben said, our panel is focusing on the relationship between UNRWA and Palestinian refugees. My own perspective on this subject comes as a historian. I work on Palestinian refugee history, so I want to really try and historicize this subject and give it that broader perspective in keeping with our focus today, which is obviously looking at UNRWA across seven decades. Now, the relationship between UNRWA and Palestinian refugees is one that's generally depicted as fraught, right? So these are the kind of images that we're used to seeing in the media, depicting uh, reports about the latest Palestinian refugee protests against UNRWA. Uh, usually, these types of images will accompany stories concerning protests, demonstrations, rallies, sit-ins, nearly always in response to uh, service cuts and reduction in the provision of UNRWA programs. And accordingly, there has been an increase in, this kind of, um, in these kinds of demonstrations and protests in recent years as UNRWA has found itself increasingly underfunded and overstretched and has therefore been forced to make even further cuts to its services. 
That being said, even though it appears to have increased in recent years, some degree of tension between the refugees and UNRWA has been in many ways a continuous feature of the last seven decades. And so what I'd like to do for the next 15 minutes or so is unpack what's really behind this tension by examining the relationship over its history. And I want to focus in particular on the issue of ownership. So what we might ask, whose agency is UNRWA really? Who does it really belong to? And in terms of UNRWA's structural dynamics, we can see pretty clearly that there are a number of actors who have formal leverage over the agency. So officially, of course, UNRWA is a UN agency. It receives its mandate from the General Assembly. It's also, formally speaking, accountable to the General Assembly. This is where it has to report every year on what progress it's making in implementing its mandate. Financially, however, UNRWA is not dependent on the UNGA, but it's instead reliant entirely on voluntary donations, as we heard from Rachel this morning. And in this sense, it is reliant on funders who have historically nearly always been Western governments, or for the most part have tended to be Western governments over the last seven decades. The other key actor in logistical terms is, of course, the host states, because UNRWA is unable to perform any of its operations without the cooperation of the host states where it's working. So in terms of UNRWA's structural setup, we can identify all of these actors. But what we don't see here are the Palestinian refugees themselves. Formally speaking, when UNRWA was set up in 1949 and when it started operations in 1950, it really reflected the broader culture of humanitarianism in the mid 20th century, which generally treated refugees as passive recipients rather than active agents in the process. As in keeping with this, the Palestinian refugees were not factored into the formalities of UNRWA's setup when it was created. And over the decades, we could also argue that their absence from this formal structure reflects their broader marginalization and the attempts we've seen from numerous parties around the world to try and silence them across their political history. However, despite this formal exclusion, in practice, Palestinian refugees have, of course, interacted with UNRWA in two key ways. Firstly, and primarily as recipients of UNRWA services and programs. But secondly, and no less importantly, as staff. So as many of this audience will be aware, more than 90% of UNRWA staff are themselves Palestinian refugees. Um, in fact, there are some estimates that put the figure as high as 99%. And in fact, in view of this figure, we might question the very title of this panel and whether it's even really valid to speak about a relationship between UNRWA as one entity and the Palestinian refugees as another, as though they're entirely separate. It might really make more sense to think in terms of hybridity, to see UNRWA as a hybrid model or a hybrid body that has, within its complicated structure, numerous competing actors pushing their various claims of ownership over the agency. Now, of these various competing actors, it is, of course, the Palestinian refugees who have the least formal power. <laughs> Even though they do comprise the vast majority of UNRWA staff, they're disproportionately found on the junior levels. Senior management tends to be dominated by internationals and has always been dominated by so-called internationals who are usually Westerners. And yet, regardless of their structural disempowerment, the Palestinian refugees have nevertheless continuously made use of the limited leverage they do have in order to exert their influence and push forward their claims to ownership over UNRWA to declare that it's actually their agency. And what's more, they've sometimes done so with considerable success. And this is where I'd like to turn to history, as I said at the outset. So to understand how the Palestinian refugees have sought to declare and promote their claims of ownership over UNRWA, we need to consider what their main demands towards the agency have usually been. And for this, I'd like to quote Salah Salah, who's a Palestinian refugee himself and head of the PNC Refugee Committee. He once told me that the Palestinian refugees have had and continue to have two major grievances regarding UNRWA. The first concerns the feeling that UNRWA is not providing adequate services, that it's not sufficiently investing in its provision of programs and aid and welfare to the refugees. Of course, there are all kinds of reasons for this, many of which are beyond UNRWA's control, as we heard this morning. But nevertheless, this, according to Salah, is the first major long-running grievance 
And the second is the grievance that UNRWA, or the feeling that UNRWA is not sufficiently representing the Palestinian refugees' political rights. I think this is something we heard about in the question this morning, right? There's a feeling that UNRWA should be doing more to push forward the Palestinians' political rights, and that in some sense, UNRWA serves as a representative for the Palestinians, who are, of course, stateless, particularly in the UN sphere. So if we keep both of these grievances in mind, we can find them running throughout the continual tensions between UNRWA and its Palestinian refugee staff over the last seven decades. Now, to give one example, again, this was touched on in the Q&A before the break. We've seen continual strikes among UNRWA staff, not only in recent years, but really over the decades. So this is actually a newspaper story from 1981. I don't know how well you can all see it, but it's reporting on the sixth, stri sixth week of an UNRWA staff strike all the way back in 1981. This was a strike by Palestinian staff demanding fairer pay and working conditions. I have to confess as a UK academic currently on strike for the same thing. I feel some affinity with it. But notably, I, I would imagine most of you can't read the text, but it's mentioned and it's, it's uh, significant that a large number of those on strike at this time were teachers in UNRWA schools. So as many of us will be aware, education has been and continues to be UNRWA's largest program in terms of budget and personnel and resources, and the vast majority of teachers in the UNRWA schools have always been Palestinians and usually Palestinian refugees themselves. What's more, Palestinian teachers in UNRWA schools unionized very early on and were very effective in protesting, or sorry, were very active, I should say, in organizing collective industrial action to protest for their rights as laborers, often but not, entire, uh, not exclusively around fairer pay. So in this case, we can see a very clear alignment with what Salah identified as the first major grievance of Palestinian refugees about UNRWA, which is the complaint that it's not sufficiently investing in its services. We can see this as including resources such as you know, staff, human resources. There's a complaint that it's not fulfilling its mandate in providing sufficient funding for the, for the education program. However, it's vital to keep in mind that these kinds of grievances and these complaints are not only about uh, UNRWA's mandate or about um, services. Any grievance over UNRWA service is also in many senses a political issue. So Palestinian refugees have historically seen UNRWA's work not as charity, but as a right. There's a strong idea that UNRWA services are an entitlement of uh, are an entitlement held by Palestinian refugees because the UN and the so-called international community in general holds considerable responsibility for their plight. The UN and the international community first facilitated partition of Palestine in 1947, fa then failed to protect Palestinian rights in the subsequent two years, and since then have continually failed to implement Palestinian refugee rights. So accordingly, the plight of the Palestinian refugees is in a large part attributable to the actions of the UN and the international community. And as such, the UN has a duty to provide services to them until their plight is resolved. Now, we can see that kind of thinking reflected here. This is an extract of a letter I found in my research in the UNRWA archive all the way back in 1961. So again, it's a long-running complaint. This was written by the head of the student union of Palestinian students in UNRWA schools in Damascus. And you can see the chair has written here, it's the duty of UNRWA to alleviate the pains of the Palestine refugees. The responsible persons in UNRWA are called not to forget that the people of Palestine have been wronged and oppressed, and it is the duty of those who cause this oppression to secure for them tranquility and ease. So several things about this language are quite striking. Firstly, we see the word duty come up more than once. So this is an obligation, not an act of charity. And also this letter talks about um, or implies that UNRWA is part of the wider system that caused the Palestinian refugees' oppression or situation. So from this perspective, in the eyes of many Palestinian refugees, UNRWA services were not welfare, but they were in fact a political right or entitlement. And again, we can see this conveyed very explicitly in two quotations here. One is from a group called the Badge of the Arab Palestine Youth. This was an informal organization of young Palestinian refugees in Lebanon 
in the late 1950s and early 1960s. And they wrote, uh, issued a statement to UNRWA in 1960 where they explicitly said, the services of our agency are our rights and not favors or charity from her. Also striking here that they refer to UNRWA as our agency, so a very explicit declaration of ownership over the agency and a feeling of it as being, in some senses, belonging to the refugees. And then nearly 20 years later, we have a similar statement cropping up in a letter from the leader of Balata camp in the West Bank to the UNRWA Commissioner General, where he says, we are your responsibility and you should provide us with relief, care and services. So we can see this idea is, um, crops up again and again over time and across the various fields where UNRWA operates. From this perspective, when UNRWA services are being cut, it's not just an issue um, in humanitarian terms, it's actually an infringement of Palestinian rights. And as such, in going on strike for them or in protesting for them, the Palestinian refugees argue they're not only campaigning for their labor rights or their humanitarian rights, they're also campaigning for their political and even their national rights. This, in many ways, is what the historian and anthropologist Ilana Feldman has referred to as the right to be political, the Palestinian refugees' right to be political. Again, it chimes with much of what we heard this morning, and it's worth briefly considering what's meant by this. As we know, UNRWA was created in the late 1940s. Um, I just realized I didn't print off the last page of my presentation, so. <laughs> Let's wing it. Okay. <laughs> so, UNRWA was created in the late 1940s as part of the emerging new sector of humanitarianism. This was a sector which was influenced by, among other things, the legacies of colonialism. And as such, it tended to construct aid recipients from the global south as objects with, uh, as objects to whom humanitarian aid should be administered. They were not constructed within this as actors or as political agents. Now, I don't want to go too far in criticizing UNRWA on this because UNRWA was by no means unique. I'm talking about a period 70 years ago, and I'm talking about a much wider culture that UNRWA was the product of. Things have changed since then. But part of the reason things have changed is because of the refusal of aid recipients across the global south, including Palestinian refugees, to accept the fact that they've been constructed simply as humanitarian objects. They sought to reposition themselves and to assert themselves as actors within the process. We can see this, obviously, in their strikes and campaigns for their labor rights, in how they repositioned UNRWA services as a political entitlement and not merely charity. But we can also see it in more overtly, explicitly uh, political campaigns from the refugees. And to give an example of this, I want to return briefly to education. So as I mentioned, the vast majority of teachers in UNRWA schools have been and continue to be Palestinian refugees themselves. Here are a couple of pictures of Palestinian refugee teachers at work in schools. Both of these are in Jordan over the decades of UNRWA's work. And in addition to campaigning for their rights as UNRWA staff, the teachers were often also actively involved in campaigning for their right to express their identity as Palestinians in their teaching and to convey this to their Palestinian students. Now, one particular grievance here over the decades has been the content of the curricula that are taught in UNRWA schools. Because as many of you will be aware, UNRWA schools use the curricula of the host states in which they are located. So those in Lebanon use the Lebanese curricula, in Jordan they use the Jordanian curricula, etc. In the West Bank and Gaza, since Oslo, they have used um, more Palestinian-specific developed curricula as part of the um, PA structures, but I'm talking more historically before we've got to that stage. Now, the reason the use of host state curricula was controversial is because most of these curricula did not contain a huge amount of teaching about Palestinian-specific <coughs> history, and particularly the Nakba. So either it would be mentioned um, as part of a wider discussion of Arab history, or in the case of Lebanon, it wasn't really mentioned at all. And this was a cause of grievance because many Palestinian refugees felt that their, the younger generations weren't really being taught to understand their situation. Why was it they were living as refugees? And why was it they were finding themselves stateless? Another quote here from Fawaz Turki, who's himself a Palestinian refugee from Haifa. He left as a child during the Nakba, and he was educated in an UNRWA school in Lebanon. And he later made this statement, 
there, are, there can be similar sentiments found across refugee testimonies where he talked about how UNRWA schools were designed or had the effect of raising Palestinian children on and educating them in accepting their plight of life as a preordained thing. He says no attempt was made to explain the situation and the forces behind it, and then explicitly no courses were offered to show where they came from, the history of Palestine. Now, we can critique this up to a point because the history of Palestine did come up in many of the Arab host state curricula, just not in a lot of detail. Um, probably more importantly for our purposes, it was also the practice of many Palestinian teachers, not to mention parents and families, to ensure that younger generation did know the history of Palestine. But nevertheless, there was a strong campaign for a more formal inclusion of these subjects in the curriculum. And strikingly, the Palestinian teachers' unions included this in numerous strike demands over the decades, often in alliance with student unions as well. In fact, they, their attempts briefly bore fruit in the 1970s in Lebanon, when UNRWA agreed to include Palestinian history and Palestinian geography in its schools there, although the plan to implement this was never fully rolled out because of the impact of the Israeli invasion of Lebanon. Nevertheless, it's striking as an attempt, um, it's striking as a case study of uh, Palestinian refugee success in agitating to recreate UNRWA in their own image. So, oops, final slide, because I can see you. Sorry, Mick, I've gone on to your, I've stolen your intellectual property. There we go. Um, <laughs> final slide. What does all of this mean for us today as we consider UNRWA at 70? Uh, firstly, I would highlight the importance of remembering that UNRWA does not exist separately to the Palestinian refugees. It is very much entwined with them, and in fact, the vast majority of UNRWA staff are themselves Palestinian refugees. And secondly, as we understandably get caught up in discussing the top-down dynamics of political international diplomacy around UNRWA, it's vital not to forget the voices of the Palestinian refugees themselves, which they have struggled to express continuously over the last seven decades. That's it. Thank you, Anne. That, that's a masterclass in how to wing it. Uh, if, you hadn't, if you hadn't told us, we'd have never have guessed. Um, so I want to move uh, immediately to our next speaker. Uh, Michael Dumper is a professor in Middle East politics at the University of Exeter. His research is primarily on future options for Palestinian refugees and the city of Jerusalem. He's the author uh, of a number of books, uh, most recently... Uh, the Politics of Sacred Space, the Old City of Jerusalem, and the Middle East Conflict. Michael. Right. Uh, thank you, Ben. And uh, thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, can you hear me at the back? Yeah. yeah. Um, my first, actually, connection with UNRWA when I was when I was a 19-year-old student. And I, um, they, they used to run um, summer camps in uh, Gaza. And in 77, I was a volunteer English language teacher in Darabella camp. And uh, it's been really an interesting journey watching UNRWA change and develop over that time. And I'm very pleased to be invited to this. Um, anniversaries are sad occasions, um, for various, for particularly the UNRWA anniversaries, because we don't wish it to continue forever, and it, can, it seems to be carrying on. There are moments for reflection, and uh, we're really having some of that already. Um, here, I'd like to think a little bit about the future, so a bit of speculation. And I can see the title is Responding to Crises and Building a Just Future. And it feels to me that we need to know what's coming around the corner, what's on the horizon, uh, bef uh, in order to see how we can achieve this just future. So what I want to do is take stock of the role of UNRWA as an actor in Middle East politics and identify some of the key trends globally and regionally and locally which are impacting the work of UNRWA and then unpack one or two of these and how they might affect the future role of the agency. It's very important that, that you understand that I'm, when I do this, I'm not saying this is what should happen and this is not, I'm not saying this is what I want to happen. I feel I have the uncomfortable task of looking a little bit into the future, and it's not such a good 
future, but I feel it's important that we uh, need to unpack it and talk openly about it. So the best way to start, really, is to just sort of, where are we at? And I think um, uh, we've sort of, I won't go through these slides, but we've got a sort of... Uh, uh, a variety of views of people who feel that UNRWA is a cause for the perpetuation of the conflict, while others uh, uh, who are also critical of UNRWA on the Palestinian side feel it's, it's, a, it's a stooge of the imperialistic and donor community, uh, and, uh, um, and in some sense UNRWA is caught between these two sets of critics. Um, I won't go into detail because I don't really have much time, but uh, these slides, uh, um, you're welcome to have a copy later on. Um, so what I want to do is look at the, the global level, the regional, and at the local. And I'll rip through this quite quickly, I'm afraid. Um, so what is happening globally? We've got what is office, uh, clearly thought as a decline in the US role in the Middle East, and possibly the rise in Chinese and Russian uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, foreign policy interventions uh, across, across the Middle East. The you know, European Union is preoccupied with integration of Eastern Europe and distracted from the, the, the concerns there, and it's also particularly preoccupied by the Syrian civil war and the fear of uh, mass migration, both from Libya, uh, the, 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 south, the south of, of, of the Mediterranean <clears throat> Sea, and, and to the east. Uh, the rise of protectionism and popular, uh, popularism as a result of the 2008 financial crisis is making people less uh, inclined to um, uh, uh, be involved in humanitarian assistance. And also there's this huge uh, issue of climate change which is beginning to supersede uh, people's concerns about humanitarian assistance around the world. People are more and more concerned about the climate change issue, and therefore there's a diminishment of the resources available. We've also got the emergence of new power centres. Big mega cities are becoming more and more important, dwarfing sometimes the, st the power of states to act, and sometimes cities are where the largest uh, political action is taken. So there's a different configuration going on in terms of what sort of actors do you need to get on board. And obviously we know this religious ideologies uh, becoming and, and identities becoming very important, uh, and uh, identification with particular states perhaps being taking a, a, a lesser role. But these kind of global issues involved, and some of this can be seen in, um, from the U.S. Na National Intelligence Council, which uh, advises the de Department of <coughs> Defense, where they're sort of trying to look at the power of the different uh, <coughs> uh, uh, major major countries. And by adding up all these different elements, the US is obviously in, in advance, in, in, in ahead, but it is also projecting into the future where we've got this um, position here where, where in 2020, where the US is obviously ahead, but in, by 2035, China rises and the, uh, uh, India also rises by 2045, 2050. That, uh, these are two different kinds of calculations, but actually the overall picture is very similar. <coughs> so what's happening more locally in the Middle East? Um, well, we obviously we have the Syrian civil war, and I won't go into, uh, uh, into that, but the ramifications that, of that are enormous in terms of absorbing uh, political will, resources, and also the balance of power in the region. Uh, sucking in external intervention, the Arab world is increasingly fragmented. The idea of Arab unity is sometimes <coughs> now laughed at, and the chances of that being, uh, being repaired in the future is, is quite remote. Uh, Israel can act with impunity in the, in the, Arab, in, in, in the Middle East. It's uh, clearly the strongest uh, political, uh, relig uh, sorry, uh, military power, um, and uh, it's able to act without really any other uh, um, sort of constraints on its activities. Um, there is a sense in which the whole the, the spread of U, U, UN universal values is really taking the back seat, and there's much more uh, um, uh, 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 adherence to religious uh, ideologies, um, and making it really difficult to kind of uh, establish human rights as, as a kind of the, the baseline by which uh, uh, policies are f formulated or judged. And then you have this uh, failure of the Palestinian-Israeli negotiations uh, and the possible collapse of the Palestinian National Authority 
leaving no political horizon for the Palestinian re refugees uh, <coughs> and those, uh, the, their supporters. Um, so if you turn to UNRWA, um, I've, well, I don't want to repeat what you've heard this morning. I'm sorry I, I missed it. I was on the train coming from Exeter this morning and I couldn't get here earlier. Um, uh, so I don't want to re re uh, repeat what, what is that about that, but obviously there is a, a, a the crisis is there, it's ongoing, um, and there's a, a lot of issues around funding. But perhaps we could just refer to some of the, uh, to talk a bit about the, the demo demography. We can see, I think it's in the next picture, you can see a rise in the population. This is from the medium term strategy report. Um, these figures need slightly updating again, but that's the the, you can see the huge increase coming, uh, which means it's, it's just going up and up and up. And so this obviously has quite an impact on what UNRWA can continue to provide if the budget doesn't increase. Particularly the, the demography, the, the profile of refugees is changing. There are more and more older people who have particular health needs which require different kinds of resources. So not the same as the resources that were 30 or 40 years ago. It's a different kind of medical attention is required. And so that's a, a big uh, call on, on, um, on, the, uh, on the budget. Uh, I think the insulin bill for UNRWA is the highest in the, in the, in the developed world, uh, <coughs> developing world. Um, it's been increasing, especially hardship cases. There's a real problem, and it was mentioned earlier this morning, of uh, the disaffected youth and underemployment. <laughs> and then we have already heard about a, quite a politicised uh, uh, workforce, which doesn't always uh, work uh, in hand in hand with the senior management. Um, these are, again, is taken from the MTS, the Medium Term Strategy Report, and you can see how the breakdown, I'm not sure how clear it is at the back, but you can see how clear um, what it will look like in 2021. That is what UNRWA is planning for in 2021. Um, sort of step back a little bit from the specifics, a little more general. There is pressures on UNRWA in terms of its, its position as a UN actor is being eroded. It's been seen as a partisan force, just pro-Palestinian, and it's been, been pushed into that position by uh, lots of... Uh, um, uh, uh, media coverage, or, um, but by ho you know hostile um, uh, opponents. Um, there's a sense in which, because of the problems that the host countries are having themselves, its influence in in, in able to protect Palestinians is, is undermined. Particularly, you can see this in in, in, Sy in Syria, and there is all this competition between the donors, the refugees, the host countries, and other uh, agencies. Um, and there's been a bit of an issue around, you know, uh, uh, Gaza needs a particular kind of framework, Lebanon needs a particular kind of framework, so, so does Jordan, and uh, trying to get the, the consistency across the fields of operation is, is quite difficult. However, let's sort of say, well, before we sort of look into the future, what has UNRWA got with it? What is it uh, what's it bringing with it? Apart from the numbers of people it employs, it's very interesting to see that in comparison to other agencies, uh, international agencies, UNRWA is actually in the field close to the beneficiaries. It's, it's uh, got its offices, its uh, equipment, its, uh, uh, it, its personnel in the field. It doesn't have to send out uh, you know, um, people from Geneva or New York in order to execute uh, particular decisions. So it's very responsive. It says 90% uh, of the staff are Palestinian, and so therefore the, uh, they understand the situation very clearly. Um, and the education system has been regarded as the best in the Middle East. I know some people have caveats about the methodology of the World Bank report, but in, in, still in relation to the other uh, uh, Middle Eastern education systems, it's regarded as still the, the best. And the schools have a very, very important role in remaining open at times of crisis to give uh, stability and security to, to students when these crises take place. Another very strong thing in its favour is the, the role of international law. It's, everything UNRWA does has to be com <coughs> compliant with international law, so there's a transparency and an accountability there, uh, which is very, very important. 
which sometimes is uh, over and above what uh, you might expect from other um, organizations and has strong uh, international support as a result. Um, I'll just sort of skip this one. Now, we've we talked about the... I think this morning uh, Rachel talked about the budget cuts. And actually, before I go on, I would just like to mention here... Um, there was a huge crisis. They nearly had to shut down the agency. You, you probably heard all that. But I think I need to um, give credit to the departing Commissioner General Pierre Cranville, who, despite the criticisms that have been of him, was very responsible in marshalling funds to keep the agency going at a very, very critical time. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's a real shame that whatever uh, took place has led to his departure. But I think uh, we owe, oh, UNRWA owes, uh, and refugees owe him um, a debt of thanks for maintaining the, the, the funding during this particular difficult period. What was uh, particularly difficult for UNRWA was that this was there was no, no preparation. It wasn't phased out. It was a, uh, it was a sudden, instantaneous shock. Um, and I think that uh, uh, made it very, very difficult for the agency to respond. And it was clearly not necessarily UNRWA that was the sole target. It was also attacking the, the Palestinian National Authority uh, and uh, has had the impact of slightly detaching the U.S. from the, uh, the discussions around the future, either of the agency and of, of uh, the Palestinian uh, uh, situation. Um, you probably had this discussion about what, what, was, what, were, what was, would have been the impact if the funds hadn't come through. UNRWA was able to respond very, very well. It set up, a, got, it diversified its, 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 its donor support, uh, its discussing with the World Bank, a trust fund, to talk about Islamic endowments. Uh, it received strong solidarity from the, many of the Arab states, particularly Jordan. Um, and as in just interestingly, the Israeli intelligence is very concerned about uh, UNRWA uh, collapsing because of the impact it would have on, on Gaza and the West Bank, and as obviously on Jordan. Um, so what we have is a situation where uh, so UNRWA is in some sense is slightly stronger in terms of a diversica diversification of its donor base, but we have no idea how long this will continue. So there's some uh, positives, but it is uh, extremely uh, um, uh, unsure about its future. So, thinking about the future, <clears throat> um, I've just pulled three out of the sky, okay? Uh, there's others you can look at. We can look about look at uh, Trump being re-elected in... Uh, oh, no. You know, there's... Uh, I'm not... Don't laugh. <laughs> <It's, clears throat> um, there's, the, there's issues in the, in the Middle East. I mean, I just pulled these out um, uh, as things I've discussed with people at length in, in, in different fora. Um, so, and again, uh, this is again is not something that I say should happen, but I'm saying this is the kind of thing that might happen. So, the renewal of the mandate was difficult this time round. There were some, some uh, countries made their support contingent on various uh, ch uh, changes and uh, uh, um, uh, decisions that UNRWA would need to take. Next time round, it might be harder. And the, they may have more leverage. And this, this sort of UN, US-Israeli agenda of somehow making the refugees in Jordan, who have Jordanian passports, no longer refugees, and therefore no longer entitled to... Uh, um, uh, under the UNHCR kind of criteria, wouldn't be entitled to um, uh, assistance in the same way, uh, refugee assistance, may become... Uh, may be adopted by other donor countries. That is a possibility. It certainly been has been discussed. Am I nearly there? Okay. All right. What I want to look at is number three. I'll just look at it in a bit more detail. Here is possibly the collapse of the Palestinian National Authority, what, it might, uh, what impact it might have on UNRWA. So, clearly, there will be some transfer of Palestinian functions to UNRWA. Additional schools, <coughs> health clinics, uh, uh, some educational other ed educational programs, uh, and some possibly representational issues. 
there'll be definitely all the refugees that were using the PNA services will be fl come flooding back to UNRWA. The ones that were starting to go into the state schools, the Palestinian state schools, would start coming back to uh, UNRWA schools. Israeli activities in the West Bank will probably lead to the great more expulsion of refugees. UNRWA will be hard, find it harder and harder to move around. Access to Jerusalem will be even more difficult. And there'll be more and more restrictions on, on uh, staff getting access to um, people and providing aid. More on the political level, it would mark the end of the two-state solution, and some donors may say, well, what is the point at UNRWA in, in the future? Uh, the West Bank itself might fragment into militias, Nablus, Hebron, because the money's not there to support the police. There's 60,000 policemen who will need paying. Uh, they might all kind of divide up into small militias. And again, this will have an impact on UNRWA's uh, services. Perhaps it's not all, may not all be bad. On one hand, uh, uh, it, Israel will not be an annexing the West Bank and giving citizenship to the people in the West Bank. It will, so there'll be increasingly apartheid type, uh, uh, or more obviously an apartheid type system, which might increase uh, support for uh, Palestinians. It might increase, in fact, UNRWA's funding, because people will say, well, uh, UNRWA's the only institution, like in, Gaza, like in Gaza, it's the only institution the international community trusts, so a lot more money will go uh, into UNRWA. We don't, we don't know. No, I'm just imagining things. Um, some of the funding uh, and service provision might be shifted to other agencies, including Israeli state agencies in, in the West Bank. And this may free UNRWA from uh, all the hassle of finding the money and all the employee uh, issues that are uh, uh, attached to that. Um, and uh, you have, might have the situation where, like in Gaza, the role of UNRWA as a, as a kind of quasi de facto represent, representative of the Palestinian refugees is increased. It's a, a role that UNRWA clearly has resisted, uh, does not want to supersede the PLO, but in the absence of uh, the PNA, uh, this, 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 um, the trend may be pushing UNRWA more and more to that, which will make it difficult. For, for UNRWA uh, uh, politically. So, just to kind of sum up, um, I think the challenges to UNRWA are not just about money, they're deep existential ones uh, about the politics. Um, it's unlikely UNRWA will continue in the same way as before. We're kind of assuming for, we're just going to lurch from one crisis to another and it will continue, but it's very unlikely it will do so. There'll be definitely a decline in the role of the Palestinian refugees in the world's attention. And if you're thinking even belong 19, uh, uh, belong beyond another 20 years, it's very hard to envisage UNRWA existing uh, and having an anniversary at, at 90. We may actually be, uh, there may be a situation where a new mandate is enforced onto UNRWA through the General Assembly, and the discourse might change from re refugee rights to the rights of indigenous peoples, like in New Zealand or Australia or uh, um, Native American in, uh, in, in, in Canada and North America. So what I'm thinking is that, okay, it may not be happening next year or the year after, but we like the, cri the climate crisis. We have to plan in advance. And uh, certainly consultation with Palestinian refugees must be at the heart of this. They must be involved in thinking through, strategizing what is going to happen. Um, and we ha there is a real imbalance. While on one hand there's a very strong legal case for the Palestinian re refugee rights, the donors have a very strong uh, control over the operational side of things. And that, that is a, a balance which at the moment has worked in the Palestinian favour, but it may not always work in the uh, Palestinian's fa favour in, in the future. Um, and uh, so what I'm suggesting is that this fear that we have that if we talk about these things, uh, we, we, that we might engender a self-fulfilling dynamic, uh, I think is actually a, a mistake. We need to talk about these things in order to start putting some things in place so that what comes out, what, what, what evolves, is much more uh, um, uh, 
configured to what the Palestinian refugee needs. Thank you very much. Okay. okay, thank you. There's a huge amount of information from those two presentations for us to chew on, and the, the, uh, the spectre of another Trump term uh, being waved before us is always very good to help us focus our minds, I think. We've got some time for Q&A. We can go a little bit, I think, into the lunch period. So I'm going to, um, I think, try and take three questions at a time. We'll see uh, if we've got time to come back for another round. I'm going to ask people, because we are challenged for time, please to be really focused. So please make it a question, and ideally make it a short, focused question. So, gentlemen here. Can I have the other hands up who are up so I can just catch everyone? And we'll go here afterwards and here. Thank, Thank you, you so much for your presentations. Uh, my question for Anne, um, I, uh, as development professional, I think the best aid is to uh, build the capacity of local authorities so they can take the lead on the future because aid can be forever. So um, my question is specifically for the uh, honorable work in the uh, Gaza and West Bank. Do you think from your research historically that the UNRWA has somehow undermined the capacity of the Palestinian Authority to the extent that today we are talking about uh, scenarios of the collapse of this authority? Thank you. Okay. Down here at the front. Yeah, hi. I just wanted to pick up on one of the comments from Mick's presentation, which was the discussion of the shifting of some services potentially to Israel and um, the potential future there. Um, and one thing UNRWA is looking at right now, and I think would be worth brainstorming here and perhaps outside of this scenario, is the fact that um, attempts to remove UNRWA or for Israel to take over its services in the absence of any current alternative solution are governed very strictly under various laws. First of all, of course, we have the Komi Mikkelmore Agreement of 1967 with the Israeli authorities. Our position is not that that is a consent to us being in the territory of the OPT. A, because we predated occupation. B, because international humanitarian law dictates and governs the rights of the occupied people. And any changes, certainly in the demographic in the occupied region and potential annexation, is governed by the Fourth Geneva Convention. OK, thank you. And gentlemen over here in the second row. Hello. Yeah, a question from Michael. So do you think with the uh, removal of um, US funding from UNRWA, it will uh, release the potential for UNRWA to become more political? OK, so Anne, do you want to take the first sure. one? OK, so your question was about uh, whether UNRWA has weakened the PA. Um, I know what you're getting at in the sense that having these sort of dual quasi-governmental systems in place could be seen as undermining the role of the PA, but I think it's probably uh, not accurate to say that UNRWA has, has um, been a factor in weakening the PA. So when, as, as you're probably aware, when the Oslo system was put into place, uh, initially there was talk about gradually transferring UNRWA services over to the PA as, a, as part of the what was meant to be an interim five-year period leading up to a, a Palestinian state. And in fact, for example, as part of that, some of UNRWA's archives were given to the, or shared with the Institute for Palestine Studies as a precursor to that. I think what's really undermined the capacity of the, the, the PA is, is bigger structural features around the inherent flaws in the Oslo system um, and shifts in Israeli and international politics away from supporting it. Uh, you could also make the case that UNRWA has actually been quite significant in allowing us to continue to speak about Palestinian refugees in the West Bank and Gaza um, and ensuring that that remains part of the international discourse on the West Bank and Gaza, which otherwise could risk being lost. Um, so I would say um, not. <laughs>
on that front, even though I understand the question. Thank you. Yeah, uh, just there's two points. Um, I mean, Rachel's point that Israel is constrained by international law and what it can do in terms of uh, taking over UNRWA institutions. Uh, I completely accept that. Um, I'm just envisaging a situation where uh, the, that law is, those laws are, are ignored and there's very little um, uh, response from the international community. I mean, frankly, what is this going to, who is going to stop Israel doing what it wants in the West Bank if, it's, uh, if it decides to take these things over? So, yes, the laws are there, but I'm not sure if the... the uh, uh, ability to make Israel compliance is, is, is there. Regarding the potential um, of UNRWA without US funding, I, I know um, th there has been some positives in the sense of the diversification of the donor base, and which has brought in many actors from different parts of the world and not just European and Arab countries, and that's been an excellent response. Um, I do think it's un... Um, I mean, the United States has been extraordinarily generous over the, the years of UNRWA's existence, and, uh, to, to, and to ignore that money, um, uh, I think, would be, would be very poor um, planning. Uh, uh, at some point, if it comes back, UNRWA may be in a stronger position to... And uh, not have the same conditionality playing with it. Because uh, wh when it accepts US money, it has to do all kinds of things with that money in ways that only the US are insisting on. And that has a knock on effect on the other donors, and that's very quite a burden. But if uh, I, there is, I, I just wonder if because the United States may want to give money, uh, donate more money to, the United, uh, to UNRWA, because it, this is the ticket to being involved in negotiations about its future. Um, UNRWA may have a little bit more control over how that money is received and allocated. Thank you. Um, I'm getting the signal we may have time just for two more questions if they're short and focused. Uh, are there any further questions? So if we take one here, and there was a hand, t Tim over here, so these two. So it could, uh, fourth row there. Thank you. My question for both of you, uh, you have spoken about top-down perspective. What about down-top perspective, the role of Palestinians themselves? I asked this question before, but I am really very interested because with the lack of the funding and with the lack of opportunities, how do you see the role of Palestinians themselves as an active agent, not passive recipients of it? So how you see it, because you didn't mention it here and maybe in the, for the future, and uh, I would like to understand more from, from you as well about the role of, of us as Palestinians. Thank, Thank you. you. And over here in the second row. Thank you. Tim Hogan. Uh, you say that the United States has been extraordinarily generous. We know that. It's been extraordinarily generous to Israel, and it is still being extraordinarily generous to the, what is the terrorist state of Israel. Now, 10 years ago, John King, uh, we all remember him broadcasting from Gaza, when Palestinian children were being killed daily by terrorist Israelis. It's still going on, and we're still talking about it. What is the solution? Okay. That's, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's an easy one to come back in one minute, I think. But um, do you want to take both of you, both questions, Anne, if you go first? Uh, sure, I'll just speak really briefly. So your question was about the role of Palestinian refugees. Um, I mean, in some ways it's a huge question, but in another way it's a very straightforward question because the role of Palestinian refugees is arguably not for me to say. It's being declared already by Palestinian refugees themselves on the ground and in their activism within and outside camps and within and beyond UNRWA's fields of operations. So um, I wouldn't attempt to try and summarize it in 30 seconds, but I, but I think it's clear that any, it's clear from history and from the contemporary situation that any attempt to uh, address this situation while disregarding the Palestinian refugees is not going to work. 
Thank you. Um, regarding the consultation, um, I think uh, UNRWA has tried in many different ways to involve refugees in some of the decision making. Some of it is cosmetic. Some of it is, you know, that these um, is something that looks really good on the website and on the photographs that have the student parliaments that they have and such. Um, but some of it is genuine, and the negotiations that they have with the trade unions and also with some of the works councils um, and, and different uh, dialogue they have in the ca camps is, I think, is, is, is quite genuine stuff. Um, but we have to recognise the fact that for Palestinians to have agency, they have to have their own agency. They have to have... Palestinians to exercise their own will, their own determination. They have to have their own agency, and that's what the PLO is. Uh, and if that's not functioning very well, that's something that the Palestinians need to work at. Um, UNRWA can't uh, devolve decision-making to the Palestinian refugees because the money won't be given. Once it does that, the, people, uh, the donors will not give it any money. And uh, so it's, it's, it's caught. And once it wants to have the Palestinian refugees involved as much as possible, but there's certain, uh, uh, it's, it's accountable to basically the donors. And that's really quite a difficult uh, dilemma for it to, to, to deal with. What is the solution? Well, <laughs> Uh, there is what is best for Palestinian refugees, and I think a lot of you have your own ideas on, on this, and I, I would agree, agree with them. I think what we need to talk about is what is the best solution in the current circumstances or in the likely circumstances in the future, and that's not necessarily going to be that great for the Palestinian refugees. I mean, um, if you're dispossessed from your property and return to it the day after, nobody has a problem with that. If you return two weeks later, that's not so bad. You return three, three years after, that's possible as well. If you return 30 years later, or try to return 30 years later, there's other problems have evolved. And uh, it's just more complicated. Now, we are talking about 60, 70 years now, and we may talk about 80 years before people can return. And the problems, it doesn't mean Palestinian rights are less, it's just that other people's rights have increased. Uh, and I don't think there's a solution to that. Um, and in the end, there has to be some sort of quid pro quo, some sort of compromise, because uh, those, those, those new rights that are emerging from the settler groups, from the... the uh, I'm sorry, but uh, people who... Uh, fit, I, gosh, I, I don't, I don't, they don't put me in the position of defending... Uh, the, the, the acquisition of its Palestinian property. I'm just trying to say that it's more complicated the longer time passes. It's taking land by yeah. their army and by, yeah. by force that doesn't give them rights to, to exactly. increase their rights. I'm just... Exactly. Uh, I, I, I completely agree with you. But what, I, I completely agree with you. It's just that they are asserting certain uh, rights. They're saying they... they and I, I, don't, I don't think that's necessarily just, but that is what's happening. And I think you need to confront that situation. It is complicated the longer that time passes. I believe that in Palestine the situation is very bad and there's many, many difficulties on getting the rights and this yeah. stuff. But if we start calling these things in this way, yeah, yeah, right. th this would be increasing and the, 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 the things would be changed. If we started now saying they have rights and by yeah. the time they I, I agree. This, but that, we that is what. They, they yeah. And, we, and we have the right to yeah, I, I, I agree. Okay, I knew there was a danger in taking that question just before lunch, but but uh, look, we've got time over lunch, and I'm sure afterwards to uh, to address that fundamental question of how do we ensure that the core collective rights of the Palestinian people that are under greater threat than they have been at any time over the last 70 years are realised and how we hold Israel to account. So we're going to break for lunch now. I'm just checking, what time do you want people back, Pietro? So if people can return by 1.30, and before we go, can I just ask you to give a final round of applause to our two panellists? Thank you.